Good morning, good morning, good morning, people of God. thank you on this morning. We thank you for this day that you have made, Lord God. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, we are so happy that we are still among the living. We're excited about you just allowing us to connect on this morning, Lord God, and we invite you and in. we say dwell among us. We ask that you, Lord God, will uh, send forth the anointing throughout this line, Father God, to break every evil yoke right now. In the name of Jesus, we come against any distractions, the disruptions, any freezes, any disconnections. We come against it right now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your anointing. We thank you for your presence, and we pray even that my flesh will decrease and that you will increase in me, that you will teach this word through me on today, that I may rightly divide the word of truth, that it may be edifying and confident to the hearers, Lord God. And we just want to thank you for doing it. We ask you all these things in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 My God. My God. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone on this morning? My God, how is everyone? We're going to be coming from the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel on this morning, uh, chapter 16, verses 14, 1 Samuel 16, 14. Yep, 1 Samuel 16, 14. I just want to welcome any newcomers that are on. I hope you have your Bibles turned with me. We welcome you and we thank you for joining us on this morning. You could have looked at any live stream, but you decided to join us on this morning. And for that, we thank you. And we always appreciate you all who always come and join us every Sunday and Thursday. My God. Come on, we got to do um, 2 Samuel. 1614. I'm going to kind of skip the decree on this morning because I really want to get into this word, but I don't want to keep you guys very long. So I'm going to kind of skip the decree this morning and go straight into the word of God. Okay. So um, here it says in uh, chapter 16 verses 14, it says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from, the God, from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful, uh, a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that when he play it, with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you and you should be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. In verses 18, he says, the one of the servants answered and says, look, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war and in speech and handsome a handsome person and the Lord is with him so therefore Saul messages they sent for David and it goes on to say in verses 23 wherever the spirit from God was upon Saul David will take a harp and play it with his hand and then Saul would become refreshed and well and the distressing spirit will depart from him. And so I want to go on. I probably won't get everything in one lesson. But I wanted to really like talk about. The Bible refers it as a distressing spirit. 
okay, how this spirit came upon the Lord. Now, when we think of distressing, the distressing, when you look it up, it's also known as a torment, a um, torment, which is a state of great bodily or mental suffering. The Bible calls it a distressing spirit, but I want to say that on today, we call it mental health or mental illness. And I think it's so important for us to get a clear understanding of what mental illness is or what, uh, you know, someone who's is suffer suffering with mental health. I think that it's so important that we really indulge in the word of God to really understand what this thing come from and what can we do to overcome some of the challenges that we are faced with and mental illness is widespread it's so many people who are going through mental illness and and we're living in a time where everything is exposed because of social media everything is exposed everything that someone do is being recorded it's somewhere somebody that's recording something or it's a camera somewhere that's recording everything that is taking place so nothing is covered anymore everything is exposed every Thing, you know you say or do the world gets to see it the world gets to witness your suffering the world gets to witness your pain the world get to get the witness whatever it is that you're going through and we find that in this time there is so many people who are suffering with a distressing spirit, who are suffering with some type of uh, mental health issue or mental illness, you know? And, you know, I really wanna, you, I really wanna just use the term distressing spirit here because we have put such a, a bad thing. I, I don't even have the word for it, but we have made it such a bad thing uh, when it comes to mental illness. And we have talked about it in such a way where um, people, it's like a shame attached to it. It's like it's a certain amount of shame that's attached to this thing and that many people who are suffering from with it, they suffer in silence because of the shame, because they don't want people to laugh at them, because they don't want people to think less of them. And so you have so many people who are suffering with this thing, and they suffer in silence, and they uh, store away, and they're just going through and not being ever being healed from what they are going through. And this is a very serious topic. It's a, it's a very serious thing that we get an understanding of it and not take it so lightly not look at is, is um, the symptoms of it and the behaviors that are displayed through someone who is suffering with this will not be taken lightly or not be seen as a joke or something to laugh with it's not a comedy show and we have to be so careful but I wanted to talk about this distressing spirit but the uh, the Mayo Clinic gives an overview of mental illness and also called mental health disorders. And it re, um, refers to, it said it refers to it as a wide range of mental health conditions, disorders that affect the mood, thinking, and behavior. Examples of mental illnesses include depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and addictive behaviors. And so it's such a large range of symptoms or disorders that come through this, um, through uh, this mental illness or a distressing spirit. There's so many things. So we're, as you know, people may be thinking it's funny. Some of us could be suffering from it and not even know. Some of us have these disorders but we don't label them as mental illnesses. And so that's why we have to be so careful when addressing other people. We have to be so careful uh, when we see uh, people struggling with uh, food disorders or we see people struggling with anxiety and, and depression and things like this. This is all a part of our 
mental health. These are all mental health concerns that we must have compassion about this thing. We must, you know, we must show a little more love towards people and try to be more helpful. But it's, it says that many, uh, many, so many people uh, have mental health concerns, you know, uh, from time to time, but mental health concerns become mental illnesses when ongoing signs and symptoms cause frequent stress or affect your ability to function. And so it starts off as, you know, mental health disorders, but then it turns into this illness. Again, it says when it affects the, your ability to function in society, to, to function in the community in which you are in, to function in your day-to-day -day activities. And, and so uh, we may find that some people have some of these disorders, but are still able to function. But then there are those who uh, get to the point that it's so, uh, it has advanced so much that they can't function. And so we have to be so careful with this. And it says that mental illness can make you miserable. It can cause problems in your daily life, such as at school, at work, or in a relationship. In most cases, symptoms may be managed with a combination of medications or therapies and different things. I'm not going to go into the different uh, type of therapies because there's so many different uh, types of therapies that people can go through to get that. And I want to say that, you know, for those who are suffering with some type of mental illness, it's okay to get help. I know that people make it like it's a shameful thing or, you know, or, you know, like you're not normal or whatever, but it seems as if when we do the study, the research that mental uh, health disorders have become somewhat of a norm. That is, it's normal for people uh, uh, to, uh, you know, it can become normal for people to suffer with depression or, you know, all these uh, disorders uh, that it affects, um, you know, us being able to handle different things. And it's all about the mind and how we uh, process different traumas and different things that we go through. And many different people do different things. I mean, addiction doesn't even have to be a drug addiction. It can be gambling addiction. It can be sex addiction. Your work can be addiction. I remember a time in my life when I worked in the hospital, I would work like three doubles, you know, a week. I, you know, I was trying to work here. Then I had my little street hustle where I was selling clothes and pocketbooks and doing all that. But I was always doing something. Why? To escape the trauma that I had suffered. So even your work, you people, some people are addicted to work, addicted to work. They don't even realize that they are. They don't even realize that they work so much and stay busy so much because they do that to cope with the trauma and with the things that they have suffered. And those things go unaddressed and therefore they are not healed. We have not been healed in such places because mental illness have been labeled that um, it has a, a, a shame attached to it. That's, that's the only way I can say it. And so, but I want to say the American Psychiatric Association defines mental health uh, or mental health condition, or they, it says that mental health conditions involving changes in the emotions, the thinking, or behavior. It is a combinate or it could be a combination of these things, right? It says that mental illnesses are associations with distress, which we're going to get to in the scripture here. But distress or problems functioning in social work and family activity. Mental health is a foundation of emotions, thinking, communication, learning, residents and self-esteem mental health is also key um, key to our relationships personal and emotional well-being 
contributing to the community and the society in which we live in. And some, it said uh, the Mayo Clinic reports that signs and symptoms of mental illness can vary depending on mm, the disorder, circumstances, or other factors. Mental illness symptoms can affect emotions, or thoughts, and behaviors. And some of the examples are the examples of the signs and symptoms are feeling sad or down, confused thinking, or reduced ability to concentrate, excessive fears or worries, extreme feelings of guilt, extreme mood changes, highs and lows, withdrawal from friends and activities, significant tiredness, low energy or problem sleeping, detachment from reality, um, paranoia, hallucinations, inability to cope with daily problems and distress, trouble understanding and relating to situations and to people, problems with alcohol and drug use, major changes in eating habits, sex drive changes, excessive anger, hostility, or violence, suicidal thinking. So, you know, when, when I see this list, it's such broad, it's such a broad list. It's widespread. This mental illness or mental disorder is such widespread. And I believe that all of us can find ourselves somewhere on this list where there is a disorder. Like we're out of the normal order of things. There's a disorder because of, of, of something, some trauma, something that has happened, that has uh, impacted our emotions. It, you know, it was an effect of it. And we can find ourselves in probably a few of these symptoms. And so we have to take this thing so be so careful and we have to take this thing serious. It's not a laughing matter, whether it's a man or a woman, but mankind, God wants us to be healed. He wants us to be whole. And the thing is that we need one another. We need one another because you see God not coming off his throne to do anything, but he will use those who are then healthy to help those who are in a disorder place in their life. My God, we need each other. The Bible says, let them who are strong help and pray for them who are weak. And my, my brother's keeper, yes I am. We have to develop this type of mindset. We have to understand that we are a body of Christ. But I want to go into the scripture now because, you know, I, I like to find the root cause of a problem because it's my belief that if, if you don't find the root to uproot that thing, it has the ability to keep growing, to keep living, to keep thriving. And we must understand that we must go to the root cause of why it happened, to uproot it, to change the, the uh, pathology of what has taken place. Whether it be through family, generational curses, generational cycles, generational mindsets. My God. Mm. Jesus. I'm going to try to teach this thing. But I get emotional about it because we take it so lightly. We take it so lightly. My God. And, and I see a lot of people laughing about this thing and it's not funny. And shame on you. Shame on you for laughing at somebody who will be suffering from this. Shame on you. Yes, I said it. Shame on you. But on this morning, I would like for us to look at the story of Saul. A light, and I want us to look at his life, and I'm, we're going to be examining his life 
and everything that he went through just to see, look at, try to uh, locate the, the root cause and try to see how these things come about. How do people get to the stage of mental health? We know that we were uh, 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 made in God's image and likeness, according to his likeness, right? We know that everything is about uh, God is healing and wholeness and increase. He wants better for us. Uh, you know, he you know he wants us to evolve into these healthy uh, beings and all that. We know that. So then we know that it's something that that has transpired some things that has happened that has gotten people to the point of mental illness or this mental disorder or distressing spirit I, I want to you know use the term distressing spirit because I believe that there's a certain amount of shame that is um, brought to this and I want people to be tell the truth about what they're going through I want to tell the truth about what I have been through. I put the work in. I've been on this journey for since I was 44 years old. I'm 51 now. And I will be 52 this year. And I'm still on this journey. And probably I will leave this earth probably never having to tackle every trauma that I have suffered. And to and to change the mindset of it where I can work walk as a healthy person not just physically but mentally emotionally and so there is a work that needs to be done but before we can even start the work we got to get back to the root of it I talk about this in my book of who am I when I started to ask that question I had to go all the back way back to to the root of why I was suffering with rejection and insecurity and fear and all of these things. Why was I, I had to go back to the root of it? I had to do uh, uh, look at my family genealogy and what was it? You know, look at the generations and what was in my family line. What was some of the mindsets, the cycles, the behaviors? I had to look at all of those things before I could even change it. And it's not going to happen overnight. You, you have to work at it. Have, you have to be intentional. Intentional with putting your work in every day. I have to be mindful and cautious about how I think about things, how I respond to things, and, and, and to make sure that I'm processing things uh, appropriately. So there is a word, but in um in the beginning, let, let's. So I want to talk about in the beginning of uh, Saul when and he was being chosen to be king, and it says it tells us that in, in chapter nine two it says that uh, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, right? It, it says that um, and he he was more ha a handsome person than anyone among the children of Israel. Um, it talks about how his shoulders were upward and he was taller than any of the people. And so as they talking about him, so it looks, it appears as if, you know, Saul was chosen to be king and they almost made it look like, okay, well, because of the way he looked, because he carried himself a certain way. He had a certain look. He was handsome. He was tall. He was smart. He come from the tribe of Benjamin. You know, all that they made these points. So we, I, I don't want to overlook them since they discuss it because sometimes we can think because a person look good, they smell good, they dress a certain way, they all of this, you know, that, hey, they're it. They're qualified to become king. They're qualified to become king. They're qualified to sit in a certain position. And so I want, I want it, I didn't want to just look over that but I wanted to make that a point because it's when we find how he was suffering it has nothing to do with your looks and there's so many people that look well on the outside but in the inside there are the distressing spirit in the inside there are things that are disorganized that there's a disorder among the people internally and see we must start Dealing with the inside. You know, I, I've said it time and time again. I have taught the message how we must live from the inside out. But the inside has been plagued 
with so many things that disrupt and we're paying so much attention to the outside where we look good and, uh, and, and we might even talk a good language and all of that. But what is going on on the inside? And so it says that he was more handsome person than any among, among of, in, any people among the children of Israel. And by the time we get to verse 21, it says, And Saul says, Am I not a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, my family, the least of the family of the tribes of Benjamin? You know, in chapter 10, it says, it tells us that Saul was anointed. So now, even though the people saw Paul as being tall and handsome and all this, but look how he said, look what he says about himself. Am I the least? Was he talking about the least in the tribe, meaning the lowest tribe? Or he saw himself as the least of all the tribes, meaning that uh, in, a, in a devalued way. You know, we, we got to look at the mindset. But in verses, in chapter 10, Verses 23 to 11, um, it says that he ran, um, so they ran and brought him from there, um, and when, um, because Saul, uh, Samuel was anointing him, and when he stood among the people, it says he was taller than any other people from his shoulders upward, and it says, verse 24, Samuel said to all the people, do you see him who the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among the people? So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Then Samuel explained to the people um, the behavior of the royalty, and he wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man in the house, and, 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 and sent also, he sent with Saul, I mean, yeah, with Saul, men with him who hearts God had touched. But the rebels said, how can this man save us? So they despised him and bought him no presents, but he, and he held his peace. Now, I want to talk about this for a moment. Because now Saul, being this handsome person, but also seeing himself as the lowest part of the tribe. And that could have meant like, you know, it's 12 tribes of Israel, and Benjamin is at the bottom. You have Benjamin and then Joseph. So it, it could have just meant he was the youngest one, right, uh, on a trial, right? Or it could have meant uh, he seen himself low. But nevertheless, when Saul is anointing him, and Saul prevents him before the people, now, I mean Samuel, and Samuel makes it clear, right? He makes it clear about the behavior of royalty. I guess like how royalty should be treated, how uh, um, someone in leadership of a king should be treated, and how we supposed to respond to them, and different things of that nature, right? But it's saying that when Samuel finished this, and and everybody goes back to their home or whatever, there's a, a group of people that was assigned, chosen by God, that was assigned to Saul. Now these people looking at Saul, oh, I could just imagine because I know what goes on today. <laughs> okay. Uh, can he save us? Can he be, can, what kind of leader is that? Why, why, you think God really chose him to be king? How can he lead us? How, how can he save us? How can he do this? Because they look and he's skinny. He's still most, if he that tall, most likely he's skinny and stuff. And they don't think so. And um, that he's the one. And so right away, it's saying they despised him. That means they were jealous. They looked him, probably looked him up and down. Oh, I don't know. They despised him. And guess what? They bought him no presents. They didn't even give him a gift. They didn't, and which was custom, right? So, you know, you bring somebody something you, to celebrate them, to show that you honor them, you love them, to celebrate them. So in the Old Testament, they would bring gifts. They, you never went before a king or a man of God or prophet or anybody without a gift showing the honor and the respect and, that you have for them, right? And that maybe the gift show your approval, right? And so it's 
says, but they bought him no presents. And it says, but he held his peace. So they disrespected him right there. Because they didn't even celebrate him as king. They bought him no gifts to show that they honored him. Or, uh, you know, they re um, received what God has appointed. Because he didn't call himself, but God called him. Okay? So they did not even celebrate him. And it says that he held his peace. So right there in the beginning of his reign, you see that Saul was rejected. Yes, that's rejection. When people don't celebrate you or when they look down on you or when they despise you, they won't even give you a gift. Not only will they celebrate you, they won't even give you a gift for what God has done. And so that's rejection. So immediately in the beginning of his reign, we see how Saul was then rejected here by the people because of what they thought. It ain't what man thinks, it's what God thinks. But by the time we get to chapter 13, it said now, it says that Paul held his peace. That means he held it in. That means he felt some kind of way. He felt like, wow, they can't even celebrate me. He felt like, wow, they despise me, but I ain't even do this. God called me. God anointed me for this. God appointed me to be king. And so, you know, but he held that thing in. He held his peace. That means he swallowed it and he didn't say anything and he just suffered in silence. And so by the time we get to chapter 13, it says Paul, I mean Saul having reigned about two years over Israel, he's been then being confronted with this threat. 36,000 Philistines planning to attack the people of Israel. And it says that Saul, he's at the point where he's faced like, oh my God, you know, they're coming to attack us. He hear about this. The message was brought to him. And he says they're coming to attack us. And hey, it's only uh, about 6,000 of us. I mean, 3,000 of us. I need God to be with me. Where is Samuel at? Samuel's supposed to be here. Samuel not here. The people are being afraid. So the people are backing down and they're leaving him. My God. And it said that when Paul saw that the people scattered from, he said, when they scattered from me and, um, and saw that the people scattered and Samuel did not come at the point in time, it says that Paul okay, said, okay, I need to go sacrifice to the Lord. Now, this is something that he saw Samuel do and Samuel not there. So he said, I have to go make a sacrifice a burnt offering to the Lord. And so he goes to make a burnt offering to the Lord. And as soon as he finished making the offering to the Lord, it says that Samuel shows up on the scene. And Samuel says, what have you done? And Saul said, well, you know, the, 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 um, <clears throat> the Philistines were coming. They were gathered to come and attack us. The people started to scatter, gather, scatter, and you did not show up at the point in time that you were supposed to come. And I hadn't sent, um, gave an offering. So I went to make a sacrifice to the Lord. But the sacrifice was an unlawful sacrifice. And so, you know, we, so Samuel was very upset with him. And he said, what have you done? And so we see, no, now, you know, Saul, um, Samuel is upset with Saul. He's upset with him. And Saul is, um, you know, Saul, he's upset with Saul. And Saul is trying to figure out, well, what did I do wrong? You know, but out of fear, he moved ahead of Samuel. And so now we know that Saul has suffered some rejection issues. He rejected, and he's looking at things through the th through the lens of rejection. And this, re but um, his issues reveals how he would have then have trust issues because people with who suffer from rejection have trust issues, right? Because people rejection is also abandonment. So. The re if I can explain it this way, rejection is, if we think about an umbrella, rejection is the umbrella, right? But up under the umbrella, you have abandonment, you have trust issues, 
you have insecurity issues, you have all of these issues up under the umbrella. And so here we are, Saul, suffering with rejection and rejection and abandonment because if a person rejects you, they abandon you. When they reject you, they leave you and they leave you to yourself. And so here, Saul, um, having these issues, having trust issues, it's not surprising that being uh, uh, rejected that he would then think, okay, the people scattered. The people that left me here, you know, people left me here, Saul is not coming back. So, of, of course, being suffering with rejection, he said, okay, the people are leaving. They leaving me. And Saul, Samuel, has not come back. He's supposed to be here with me. He's the one that's supposed to be speaking into my life and giving me some type of directions. I'm a new king. He's the one supposed to be here, but he hasn't showed up for me. He hasn't showed up to tell me what to do, what decisions to make, how do I move forward in this battle. He hasn't been there, and so now he's thinking Samuel has abandoned me. So here you have rejection, you have the trust issues, you have abandonment, and along with that comes fear. My God, it comes fear. Not fear so much, well, yes, fear of being alone, and then fear of further abandonment. It's this fear that comes apart. And so fear, you know, saw fear. Oh my God, I didn't, I didn't offer um, a sacrifice. Let me do, let me offer a sacrifice, you know, because I need God with me. You know, I fear that, you know, the, the, the Philistines, they're going to overtake us. They may kill us. He has all of these fears. He's now operating from a place of fear. My God. And so here we can understand why then, you know, when Samuel didn't show up, that Saul would then go ahead and do what he did because he's looking from the through the lens of rejection, my God. And so Saul, but the thing is, Samuel was upset with Saul and he said, why did you do? But Saul, being looking through the lens of rejection, being abandoned, you know, being despised by people, you know, not being honored by people or all of that, you know, he just looking through one lens, through this filter of rejection, not even have considered that God appointed you and God anointed you. And so therefore God is with you. But he didn't even consider that. And that's what happens with people who suffer from rejection. Instead of them looking at God being with them and God anointed them and God appointed them and therefore God is with them, they look more so at the people who's with them, who's not with them, who's, you know, uh, who like them, who not like them. And they look at through all of this and he never even considered the fact that God was with them. He never even considered the fact that sometimes God used delays. My God. Sometimes God uses delays to uh, see if we're going to be obedient and do what he tell us to do. Sometimes God use uh, delays to build patience up in us so that we will wait upon the Lord. Uh, Sometimes God use delays to build our faith, to see if we gonna stand in faith and say, I know that God is with me. Maybe the people left me, but God is with me. Maybe the people despise me, but God is with me. Maybe the people didn't bring me no gifts to show that they honored me, but God called me and anointed me. Sometimes God used delays to see if we're going to look up from which cover my our help, or are we going to look at the people who's with us, who's not with us, who likes us, who despise us? My God, who left us, who abandoned us. And we spend so much time wallowing and toiling and being tormented with spirits of rejection and insecurity and fear and low self-esteem and all of these things. And we can trace it in the story of Saul. And I want you all to go 
don't read it because I can't read all the chapters in this time that I have. But go read it and you will see the thread of how he got to the point of the distressed spirit, mental disorder. And so he feared. And Samuel responds to him and said, you have done foolishly. Foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord God which commanded you. The Lord would have established your kingdom forever, but now your kingdom should not continue. And so the prophet Samuel, he says this to Saul. And Saul, this is in chapter 13, thir verses 13 and 14. And Saul, fearing being left alone because he had been rejected. He had been abandoned. He had been despised. The people didn't honor him or respect him. Fearing that he would be left alone. My God. That thing manifested in his life. We have to be so careful with fear. I said it before. Fear is the opposite of faith, but it works just like faith. Yep, it works just like faith. If you believe wholeheartedly that something will happen, it will manifest in your life. And if you fear wholeheartedly that something will happen, it also will manifest in your life. And that's why we better check our relationship with fear and get rid of that and make sure that we're operating with faith. But the thing that he feared the most manifested in his life, his worst fears came true. Not only was he rejected by the people, Samuel was upset with him. He only had 6,000 men where opposed. He started out with 3,000 men, it tells us. Okay, so only 600 remained with them, right? He still happened to fight these battles. And now he fought, he like, God is not with me to back me up. Well, how am I going to win this battle with 600 men? And the Philistines got 36,000. So the Fear of what he felt or what he thought or what he expected, it happened. My God. And so, you know, it, we have, oh my God, this is, this is really something. And so the, the fear, the rejection we see, the mistrust, how all of that. And, 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 and I'm just going to go back because Sam, you said, what you have done is foolish and you have disobeyed obeyed God. And I know we always preach the sermon about how Saul was disobedient and the anointed of God left him. We always preach that part. But let me tell you something. God has given me a whole nother revelation concerning this story as I look at it through rejection because it ain't that Saul intentionally was disobedient. He was disobedient because he feared being rejected. And because he feared being rejected, we will find that he listened to the voice of the people. He listened to them because he said, my God, it already been rejected. I already been a I experienced experience some abandonment. I've experienced some rejection. I've experienced, you know, some people despise me. I've experienced all these things. Well, my God, well, I don't want the little people that I got to leave me. So guess what? I'm just gonna do what they I'm gonna compromise and I'm gonna do what they say. How many of you guys can be honest that you compromise in your walk with God because you fear some people leaving you? My God, just tell the truth. The truth will set you free. I'm guilty of it. I'll be the one to raise my hand and say, I have been guilty of it. Today I sit here and I can care less who with me. Because I had to suffer the consequences of wanting people to be with me. But now I don't care who with me. Because if God with me, there are many with me. I don't stand alone. Even when I think I'm standing alone, even when it appears like I'm alone in the natural, there are many with me. If God is with me. 
my God. And so we make sacrifices and we sell out and we do all kinds of stuff because we want people in our life. We got to learn it is better to obey. Samuel told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. He think, oh, I can, I, I can uh, offer up a burnt offering. But that burnt offering don't mean nothing if you disobey the voice of the Lord. If you don't do what God tells you to do because you fear people. My God. Let me tell you something. Rejection doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to stand alone. I know it through experience. But I had to change the way I look at rejection. You know, I, I look at, you know, with the world, we look at rejection through we alone. You know, people have rejected us. Nobody likes us. And we focus so much on those who have rejected us. And we neglect to see the ones who are still with us. And appreciate them. See, we got to change, change the way we look at rejection. Let me tell you something. When God called you, can no man reject you. It's better to obey the voice of the Lord. My God. But we see people, I want to say, but we see in chapter 15, I, I would say Saul gets a second chance, but we see in chapter 15 that Samuel is anointing Saul and he's given Saul assignment to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And this is the sermon where you hear preached all the time. Saul, again, did not follow the orders given to him, but allowed the people to spare what they thought was good. But not only... <clears throat> Then he allowed the people to, to, to uh, spare what they thought was good. I want to say something about people who suffer with rejection. Because cause people who suffer with rejection is always trying to find the good in something. They always trying to find the good in somebody. They always trying to find the good in some situation. That's the very thing that gets them in trouble. That is very thing that puts them in a place that they then suffer further injury because they're always trying to find a good in somebody and they just don't know how to let go. They don't know how to let go because they've been rejected. And rejection don't feel good. It makes you feel, it leaves you feeling like you're alone, but you're really not alone. My God. And so they look for what's good. And so even though, you know, when Paul asked, uh, when Samuel asked Saul, um, you know, what happened, he, he blamed the people. He says, well, the people, you know, the people spared what they thought was good. But he, he, he co-signed that because he was looking and thinking what was good too. He wanted to spare because he like, oh, well, this is good, so let me keep this. Because people with, who suffer with rejection, they they try to figure out, well, why am I being rejected? I'm good for something. Well, I do this well. Well, I do this well, and I say this well. Well, look, I'm doing this well, and they want somebody to notice the good in them. They want somebody to notice the good in them. And so, therefore, because they want somebody to notice the good in them, they're always looking for the good in somebody else. And it could be a well, worst person in the world. It could be something that God has said no Dest utterly destroy it. It's no good. Let it go. Disconnect yourself from it. But the, it, the, the person with rejection will then have a problem. Because then that means that they're doing to someone else what has been done to them. My God. We got to be so careful with rejection. It gets us into trouble and it causes further injury in our lives 
the way that we think about it. And so Paul saw, I'm sorry, I keep saying Paul, but Saul here, we see, you know, he gets himself in trouble every time because he's looking through a filter that's clogged. It's clogged with insecurities. It's clogged with fears. It's clogged with, uh, oh my God. Low self-esteem. It's clogged with all of this stuff. So he can't see clearly. His, his, his view is distorted by the re rejection. So therefore he can't see things as God sees them. And because of the rejection, he has a problem obeying and doing what God is asking him to do because he can't understand. Because all he can say is, well, I'm good in this area and I'm good in this area. And I don't understand. Well, why would you want to reject them? Because this land looks good. Let me spare it. We can go sacrifice this later. But you see how he's looking at this man, and it's almost like a reflection. He can see the good in some of that because he real he thinks he realizes that there's good in some of him. And nobody else can see the good. And so he's focusing on his good. And then thereby looking for good in there. And so another thing, a person that suffers with rejection is very compassionate and, and thoughtful. And they have this thing where they, it's almost like, I call it a rescue syndrome, <laughs> where they want to rescue somebody. And they want to they wanna show, I'll love you. I'll love you. You rejected just like me. I'll love you. I'll love you. And that's why we can see that those who stay with him, yeah, they was picking out what they saw good because you hang around who you like. People who are rejected seem to draw the people who also suffer with rejection and who also have the same thing. My God. But when Saul confronted, when, when Samuel confronted Saul about his disobedience, he could not see what he had done wrong. And he blamed the other people. Oh my God. I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty. I have done it. Place blame on the other people. Now, I remember one time I said to God, I, said, I told you this. And I said, well God, I want to do it. But my husband, he said, and God said, uh, uh, uh. You will not blame him. I called you. I anointed you to be pastor. Oh, yeah. I'm, I did it. I'm perfect. Yep. Yeah, the truth will set you free. And I'm all about the freedom today. And no, no shackles will hold me. I'm determined to be free in every area of my life. And so you must stand in your truth. Let God be the truth and every man be a liar. I'm not, I am not going to try to act like I'm perfect. It wasn't me. I'm going to preach to y'all and I ain't never know I did it. I sure did. And we, if we want to be healed and delivered, we're going to have to stand in our truth. Call a spade a spade. But the peace, so when he confronted him, he blamed other people. He said, I obeyed the voice of the Lord, but the people took the goods. <laughs> but you're responsible for those people, Saul. You know, you, you were supposed to stop them. My God. And so when he finally realized what Samuel was trying to say to him, then he says, I have sinned. I, I sinned. I, I, I know I sinned, Samuel. I, I know I sinned. And, and the reason why I sinned, let, let me, I have to identify the root cause of why I do what I do. Why did I allow these people who I'm responsible for to do this? Well, the root cause is that fear. He says, I fear the people and that I was rejected by God. Fear. Fear 
comes with rejection. It's up under the umbrella. And so the fear of being left alone, the fear of, of the people leaving you, mm, my God, my God, we got to be so careful. And I bet if we stand in the anointing and the boldness and authority that God has given us, even if the people left, they will come back. You see, God is with you and he will defend you. We don't have to defend ourselves. God will defend us. When you are aligned with him and in his perfect will, when you obey the instructions of the Lord, you don't have to fear because when people leave, they will come back. And we have to stop trying to minister to the multitude. We look in the Bible and it says how Jesus ministered and the multitude were saved. Peter ministered boldly and the multitude was saved. And we always go up for the multitude but I'm in a time where it's a time where we come to realize and I come to this realization but if, if it's the one if it's the one life that you can change, the one word that you can speak that will change somebody's life, the one prayer that you can pray that will change somebody's mindset, the one encouragement that you give that will refresh somebody's life, if it's the one, then you are effective. You are effective. My God. Jesus. Mm -mm. We have to stop measuring ourselves by how many are with us. God told me when I first opened up the church, God told me. I said, God, where are the people at? If you call me to be a pastor, where are the people at? He said, Shannon, don't you mess. I said, I don't know if I'm being successful. He said, don't you measure your success by the number of people that's in a room. He said, you measure your success by the number of people that take what you teach and their life is transformed by it. That was early on. We had, we had, and we had only over, well, I had a ministry in my mom's house for over a year before we went into a building. And we were only in the building for a couple of months. And I'm thinking the place is supposed to be packed out. That doesn't work that way. God needs to trust you. If, I, if you don't hear my voice, are you going to wait? Or are you going to offer up an unlawful offering? If, if, you're, if the person who's supposed to be leading and guide you, if they never show up, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand on my word? Are you going to know that you know that you know that you know that I am with you? What are you going to do? When I give you an instruction, even if you don't have nobody mentoring you or anything, what are you going to do? Are you going to obey me or are you going to listen to the people? Are you going to follow the rest? See, God got to trust you. He needs to see what you're going to do. When you're left alone to make decisions, are your decisions going to be aligned up with what the instruction that he has given you? We always gunning for the, the multitude. If you change one life. And see, that's what gets us in trouble. Because there are many ones who leave, but we so focus on keeping the multitude. Want to tickle their ears to keep them to the one that's important that left. You don't even go after the one. But Jesus said in his parable, he lets us know that the one is important. And that guess what? It's okay. Even if you had to leave the 99 to get to the one, then you must do that. So we have to be so careful. We, my God. So Sam, so when Samuel confronted him, he blamed the people. Blamed the people. Because he feared. But he admitted that I feared. I feared the people. And I feared 
that I would be Jackson with God. He was feeling. My God, my God. But Samuel, then it tells the story goes on to tell us how Samuel anointed David, you know, and everything. But in this time, Saul was still, you know, operating as king. Because David got anointed young, but he didn't start his uh, ministry to years later. And so Paul, but David ended up coming uh, Saul's um, armor bearer. And Saul, um, you know, at one point it tells us how, you know, where I just read how, you know, there was a distressing spirit that came upon him. You know, I imagine when he's in this point now, he's suffering with rejection. He got abandonment. He don't trust nobody. He feared the people. He feared God left him. God done moved his anointing. He's been rejected as a king, and now another king is going to be in his um, place, you know, that's going to wear his crown. All of these things are going on. He's troubled. He's troubled with all of these things. And it says that when, when Samuel anointed David, it said then the Holy Spirit left Saul... And an evil spirit, or a distressing spirit, came on him. And so Saul was being tormented. He was suffering and suffering. He was being tormented with this distressing spirit. My God. That's experiencing severe mental suffering. I can imagine he thinking, well, what if I, if, if I would have only had somebody there, if, if, if Samuel would only showed up on time, if I would only had a mentor, if I would only, you know, been did this, if I had only, you know, stood up in my authority to the people, if I had only, you know, I could just imagine. You, you, you know, you guys, can you guys relate to that? Where you make a mistake and then you like, wow, if I could only do it over, if, if, if only if I would have said this, or only if I will, if I would have done this, or if I would have made a right instead of a left, or if I would, you know, those regrets. Can anybody relate to me to what I'm saying? Can anybody relate to soul situation where those regrets come? And it troubles you, and you can't really sleep at night. And sometimes you might not be able to eat. Sometimes you lose your appetite. And sometimes you want to isolate yourself. You know all the symptoms that I read out from, from uh, when I started off, when I talked about how the Mayo Clinic gave us some signs and symptoms, you know, where you don't eat it. You want to isolate yourself. You just want to hide. You want to go up under a rock somewhere. You want to run away and hide when nobody can you find. Can anybody relate to that? The troubling thoughts that come with, with this? My God. And so as a result of what Saul had experienced in his life and, and what his experiences caused him, the choices he made because of the experience that he had experienced, that he had suffered, and the way he thought, and the minds that he developed, and the stumbling blocks were there. My God, he was tormented. Tormented. So with experienced severe mental suffering. And the Bible says that um, when David come, he uh, played the music. It says that uh, one of Saul's people suggested, well, we, what, what, it, it seems as God had put a distressing spirit upon you. So let, we need to find somebody who will play a harp to calm you. Now, I want to say, let me just be clear about this, because it's not that, I, I don't want nobody to get the wrong pivot, that God put evil spirits on you. I don't want you to get that, because God is a good God. Good God. All the time, God is good. Okay? And... So it's not that he put an evil spirit, but it says that 
God removed his anointing from her. So when God left him and the Holy Spirit left him, it opened up and gave a way for an evil spirit to come in, which is a distressing spirit. Now, the reason why it's an evil spirit is because torment is of the devil. God is not evil. Torment is of the devil. And when the Holy Spirit leaves, it gets played. You know, like when somebody backslides, you know, they walk on with God and they're anointed. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is with them. But then they backslide and they go back to their own behavior. And then you see all kinds of spirits coming. Those are evil spirits coming. And then that man or that woman is tormented. Yes. So that's what happened. Not that God put an evil spirit on him, but when God moved his hand, it's allowed because obedience, you got to obey. And there's consequences to suffer for disobedience. Yeah. Second Chronicles 7, 4, no, not Second Chronicles 7, that's repentance. Um, oh God, oh my God. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, it tells us all the blessings that come upon you for being all obedient. But then from 15 to, I think, 68, 58 or 68, it talks about all the curses that come upon you for being disobedient. So there are consequences that we have to pay for being disobedient. And those consequences will come whether it, you are intentionally disobedient or not. Saul, it wasn't that he was intention. Well, yeah, well, he, he made some choices. He made some bad choices because he feared the people. He suffered. He didn't want to be left alone. He didn't want any more of the people to leave him and all of that. And so he made some bad choices. He made some bad decisions. And so the the distressing the spirit came upon him. He was tormented. And so one of the people suggested, hey, I know someone, Jesse. He has a son who plays music. And so they go and they get David, and David comes and he plays this harp. And it says that every time he played, that the distressing the spirit would leave Saul, and Saul, he would be refreshed. Saul would be refreshed. And, you know, everything. But <clears throat> the heart, I want to say, because I want to address that, and then I'm going to close. David, remember, was anointed. He was anointed, right? Samuel anointed him. And then he came to play the heart. So the anointing on David's life, is what was able, the reason why the distressing spirit would then leave Saul whenever David came to play. Because it's the anointing that breaks yokes. And that's why when it's important for the body of Christ to walk in obedience because we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit because it is the anointing that breaks yokes. And then if we walk walking with anointing and not operating in the flesh, but operating in the spirit, that anointing will bring yokes on people. So when people trouble and they call you up, when they get off that phone with you, they're going to be refreshed in their spirit. Why? Wow. The anointing on your life will break the yoke and cause the distressing spirit to go. The heart. The significance of that heart. David, not only was he anointed, there was anointing on him for king and leadership, but he was anointed to play that music, right? And he played the heart. And in Psalms 33, you know, when he played that, it's praise. We know that David, he was a praiser. At one context, the scriptures tells us he praised the Lord so much he 
praised him up. He praised himself up out of his clothes. You know, worshiping and praising God. He was a worshiper. He was a praiser. Okay, he praised so much. He praised himself up out of his clothes. But when he prayed, and he used those music instruments to play the um, I mean, to, as a way of praising God. Okay, so when he praised God, um, when he praised God. Guess what? That praise. God inhabit the praises of his people. Mean that God dwells in the places where his pre, uh, pre, where praise is going up, right? And so being that David was in the room with his anointed self and coming with a heart after God and a heart of praise, a mindset of praise, then guess what? The spirit had to leave. Saul. It had to leave Saul, my God. It had to leave him. And so we find that Saul would then be refreshed in his spirit. It, sa it says, uh, Psalm 31, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the heart and make melody to him an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song and play skillfully in the shout of joy. And so see how it's upright. Praise is upright to God. So David was being upright and God who inhabits the praises of his people shows up on the scene and no evil thing can dwell in the presence of God. We better check ourselves to see if we really anointed. We walking around so like, I'm anointed. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm on fire for the Lord. And all that's church dialect. We need to get in alignment with God so we can truly walk in the anointed. So some of this mental illnesses, my God, can leave the people. We're sitting in the back looking, oh my God, do you see him? Do you see her? Oh my God, look what they're doing. Look what they looking at the behaviors. Looking at the symptoms. And not offering the anointing, not offering the praise, not offering up a prayer on the behalf of these people who are suffering with a distressing spirit. The body of Christ has to stop being so lazy. Just lazy. Me, myself, and I. What about me? What about me? It's not about you. Get in alignment with what God told you to do. Get on your face and start praying. Worship God. Bow down and worship God. Humble yourself. Praise God. My God. We just sitting back suffering. Are you lifting, lifting up a prayer for these people? I don't care who they is. I don't care how fine the clothes they wear. I don't care if they clothes cost a uh, shirt cost five thousand dollars or whether it was given through them through the South Army or South the Salvation Army. I don't care if they homeless or live in the mountain I don't care. Humans are humans. We need each other. We need to pray. And stop with the lip service. Making somebody else's life a part of a gossip piece for you to talk about and gossip. God didn't call us to be gossip. He called us to be prayer warriors, soldiers in the army for the Lord. To pray without ceasing. To speak life into each other. To edify one another. To pray for one another. To encourage one another. To uphold one another. And this, this is crazy. Mental illness, mental disorders is not funny, people. It's not funny at all. You don't have to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist to offer up a prayer. 
You don't have to have any kind of credentials. All you have to do is have a voice. And matter of fact, if you was mute, you can offer up a prayer. We saw Hannah offering up a prayer to the Lord and it was answered. And wasn't no words coming out of her mouth. Eli thought the woman was drunk. My God. You don't need a title to pray. You need a consciousness, some compassion. My God. Right, listen, this is where I'm at. I'm at. We need to pray for people. Our world is sick. How are we going to call ourselves Christian? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm a Christian. That means to be Christ-like. <laughs> That's what Christian means. It means to be Christ-like. Christianity is the way of life. The way of the life that Christ lived. You call yourself a disciple? Well, a disciple is a follower of Christ. Well, what did Jesus do? Was he sitting around laughing at the man in the tomb? No. Matter of fact, Jesus went to the places where the sick people was at. Today, we want to go where all the healthy people at. We want to be among the, the people with the fine clothes and eat the best foods and talk a certain language and all of that. We want to be around the best people. We don't want to put no work in. We don't want to work for the Lord. We don't want to start at the bottom and build something up. We want to go with everything already established. Well, you ain't a true disciple. Because let me tell you something. The disciples start at the bottom. They put the work in. David was out there killing bears and lions before he wore that crown. Yeah. He was in there sleeping in the barns with the stinky stuff. Jesus was born in a barn. He, he was... um. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. But he wasn't trying to be with the in crowd all the time. You let me tell you something. Your anointing comes when you get dirty. When you pull your sleeves up and get down dirty. When you go through something. <laughs> we in a time nobody don't want to go through nothing. They want to be praised all the time, pampered all the time, patted on the back all the time. You want to be strong in the Lord? Get your hands dirty. Do the dirty work. Hit the streets. Hit the streets. Start pre uh, preaching and praying for them homeless people. That's how you anoint and come. That's how you get strong in the Lord. See, that's why God, see, that's why God don't be calling people who ain't been through nothing. You know, those people, God, see, you know what? We There's some who were sent, called, and some went. Those who went, they, they in it for the uh, Rolex, the Cadillac, red bottom shoes, Gucci bag. They in it for that. But don't, let me tell you something. God will pull a homeless man up and use him. He'll pull somebody up, you know, who get high. Somebody, know why? Because they on fire. They in it, they'll go to war. No why? Because they've been through something. We can't forget where God brought us from. So listen, that's it. I'm closing out. I'm closing out. That's it. Because mm -mm -mm. this, this, this is something. So I'm closing out. And um, listen, let's just pray for the people. But I wanted to talk about how this come about. It's the traumas in which we suffer throughout life that brings people to a place that they suffer with many disorders, where they become disorganized in their thinking and their behavior and everything. And so let's pray for these people. It's not a funny matter. So Father God, we thank you on today. We thank you and we 
praise you and we glorify you. We just want to pray for those who are suffering with mental health, Lord God. We pray for them. We pray for healing for them, Father God. We pray that you would give us a heart to lay prostrate before you and to intercede on their behalf, Father God. And we thank you for doing it in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We have asked that you would help us to recognize these symptoms in our families, in our neighborhoods, and even in our own life, Father God, and help us, Father God, lead and guide us on how to uh, uh, um, obtain healing father god not only from your word but even from those who you have called these doctors and different people that you have put in place to help us through um different situations father god and to overcome different mindsets and things of that nature father god let us no longer be ashamed we pray that you would deliver us from the shame from the shame of it father god and the embarrassment of it father god and that we may obtain the healing that we need lord god and lord god we thank you for doing it father god as we continue to pray um, on the behalf of people and even the things that we see in our own lives and families, Father God. We know that you are with us, Lord God, and that you, Father God, have healed and there you have given us everything to pertain to life. So lead us to the scriptures and the things that we need to do, Father God, that everything will be turned around, that everything that the enemy meant for evil will be turned around for your glory. And so we thank you for doing it in Jesus' name. Listen, if there's no somebody here that is, is not saved, my God, if you are not saved, you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I want to lead you into the um, prayer of salvation, okay? Repeat after me, Father God, forgive me of all of my sins. Come into my life, live in me, and help me to live for you. Father God, I believe in my heart and I I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that your son Jesus, he died, but you rose him from the dead. Father God, I accept your son Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior to serve him all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have said that prayer, we are so excited that you have decided to join the body of Christ. And the angels are rejoicing in heaven. And whatever you pray, whatever you pray, you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, it, it shall be given to you. And just know that even in your weakest days, that Jesus' strength is made perfect in your weakness. And you can always rely on God. He is dependable. He is faithful. And he will never leave or forsake you. Amen? So listen, it is offering time. You can send your offering to Give La Fly. Okay, um, at Take the Lead Outreach Ministries. Also, you can give it through cash at dollar signs TLM changes lives, or you can mail it in at P.O. Box 32143, North New Jersey 07102. Amen. So, listen, you guys have a blessed and prosperous day. Continue to pray for those who are suffering with mental disorders. Amen. Go live in divine power, authority, and all things that pertain to life in which you already have in your possession. Until next time, go and be blessed. Amen.